we are good to go. <laughs> All right. I will turn it over to you officially now. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my only question is here is, are you going to advance it or can I? I can advance it for you. Okay. I'll just say next slide and we'll go from there. So, all okay. right. Thank you everybody for your patience. Again, my name is Chris Kubiak. I'm the director of education at the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania. Um, I've, like I was just mentioning, grew up in Franklin Park. My parents still live there. Went to Northland a lot as a kid. In fact, my best friend's mom was a librarian there. So I'm always excited to speak there. But like I was mentioning before, we're going to talk about some of the major conservation challenges of our birds. Um, really, we're looking at North America and the United States, but also closer to home because we do. And again, I, I have to paint reality as it is. We've got a lot of major conservation challenges to face. So we'll go to that first slide there after the scarlet tanger. And there we go. And so let's talk about, I mean, this is as we speak, this is hot off the presses. I follow a lot of obviously population trends in the newest one that came out um, in 2022 shows plummeting bird populations across almost all habitats, including ones here in Western Pennsylvania. Um, these are birds that we don't find here in Western PA, but Rufus hummingbirds, greater sage grouse, pinion jays, 67 other birds in the US are really on the verge of extinction, let's be honest. I mean, some of them like the greater sage grouse uh, and pinion jays, there's not a whole I, positive things in there. Um, but things have been bad in other species that we have brought back as well, right? We're seeing now the fastest declines um, with grassland birds and also shorebirds, but a lot of our interior forest species um, that we have even here in Western PA are really rapidly decreasing. And this is one that I think is really sobering. This came out in 2019. Um, that if you aggregated every individual bird in North America in 1970, we'd have roughly about 10 billion individual birds. 50 years later, actually later than 53 years later, right, we're down to about 6.9 billion individual birds. We've lost a little over 3 billion birds in 53 years. That is clearly a warning sign. And you've probably all heard that canary in the coal mine phrase um, about how, again, they would bring birds into the coal mines to act as the warning. Well, birds out in our environment still do the same thing. And that should be a red flashing strobe light that we are doing some really bad things to our environment. Um, and that is not sustainable. In fact, overall bird populations in both the US and Canada have declined by 29%. Um, some species more than other, but even common species are in steep decline. We'll go to the next slide. So here closer to home in Pennsylvania, I was mentioning the ruffed grouse, right? That is, if you're not familiar, that is our state bird. Um, and since the year 2000, right, 23 years ago, its population across the state has declined more than 80%. I've seen some figures as high as 87%, um, but that's, you know, we'll be conservative and say 80%. That is a monumental population crash in a really, really short period of time, which we'll talk about, right? Another bird that is still relatively common here in Western PA, though declining are chimney swifts, 63% since the 60s. Rusty blackbirds, which we still get, they're, they're migrants that pass through up to the Arctic and down to the winning grounds, have declined 99% since the 60s. Cerulean warblers, a long distance migrant, 95% since the 60s. Golden winged warblers, 92%. Um, and here's some other ones that, again, formerly common not that long ago either. I'm saying 20, 30 years ago, like wood thrush and common nighthawk and Kentucky warbler and black and white warblers. All of those birds are in very rapid, steep decline, and they all are still found um, in greater or lesser extents here in Western PA. Some birds that are either passage migrants like black pole warblers or American tree sparrows that overwinter here are declining at a rate of four to five percent per year. That is an unsustainable decline. And if both of those species continue declining at that rate, they will be extinct in less than 100 years. Passenger pigeons, I want you to think about this though, right? Because everybody's, you know, we, we take for granted that the present is always going to be like this in the future. 
At one point in time, passenger pigeons numbered in the billions in, with a B in North America. In fact, when the first Europeans um, and, and other folks from across the world started to be coming to North America, um, we probably had somewhere around three to four billion passenger pigeons in North America. So roughly 25% of all birds in North America were passenger pigeons. They were still in the billions around the American Civil War. By 1914, they were extinct. So this can happen incredibly fast. And unfortunately, there's a lot that we're seeing with these birds. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll see here, passenger pigeons. Again, a bird like today, we take for granted robins and probably Canada geese and song sparrows, that these birds were just a ubiquitous species that would be in flocks. So it sometimes would take three to four days nonstop flying over. In a short period of time, they were gone. Go to the next slide here. And here's my shameless plug. I'm doing a program on this species. This was our only endemic parrot in Eastern North America called the Carolina parakeet. Very beautiful looking parrot that we had. It did live in small numbers. It was found in Western Pennsylvania. There's historical documentation that along the Ohio River near Pittsburgh and, and closer towards what is now West Virginia and Ohio, Carolina parakeets existed. Uh, they too were at one time relatively common and went extinct also in the early part of the 20th century. So the point is, is that when you see a lot of these birds, or even if you're not familiar with a lot of these species that I'm talking about, these extinction events can happen very rapidly and you reach a critical mass where it's basically at the point of no return, which we hope never to get to that point. We'll go to the next slide. So reasons for declines. Why are these birds declining so rapidly? Well, again, like most things, it's not a single cause. There's multi-causation that is sort of working together. Most of these though are because of us, both intentionally and unintentionally altering and impacting um, the environment. And I'm not putting this from most important to least important or vice versa. These are um, all major issues that are happening now that we are observing. So loss of habitat due to deforestation, both here in Western Pennsylvania, and more importantly, believe it or not, down in their um, overwintering areas if they're long distant migrants. Um, some of our resident species in our forest, like chickadees and titmice and nuthatches, they're showing mostly stable populations because they can adapt, they're generalists. But a lot of our interior species that are coming from the tropics are losing their wintering grounds uh, but they're also losing habitat here. Urban sprawl is a big, big problem, right? Invasive species is arguably tied to this next part. Um, invasive species, mostly in the sense of plants, right? Um, where I work, we have three reserves, but down there in Allegheny County are Beechwood Farms Nature Reserve, where my office is. We've got 134 acres, mostly forested, and that is a really compromised, damaged ecosystem. It may look green and beautiful to, to you if you ever go there, or North Park is another one to give you an example, right? Any of our county parks in Allegheny County. Some places, they're almost 100% uh, invasive species, right? And what does that do? Well, it creates a monoculture that then results in the next part, loss of insects. Out of all of these things that you see here, it's probably that Third point, loss of insects that are the biggest reason these birds are declining. But we know pesticides and herbicides are really big problems, um, both in our own yards, but also across landscapes for agriculture. Um, this is one that is very controversial to even broach the topic, but it is a major problem with bird, and that is outdoor cats, which kill close, again, conservatively about a billion individual birds across North America every year, but window strikes and of course the really big 800 pound um, gorilla overseeing all of this is climate change. And yes, we are experiencing the consequences of climate change now, which are impacting a lot of these other things like invasive species and loss of insects and then, you know, issues with habitat. So we'll go to the next slide. 
And so we'll see some slides here, right? So in the tropics, you're seeing mass deforestation for essentially things like um, things like this. I mean, you're you're seeing forests cleared for pasture for cows so they can go to be burgers at McDonald's or some fast food chains or soy that goes to China for, for production or in other parts of the world, right? For palm oil groves, which don't really have a whole lot of um, ecology uh, for, for birds. Go to the next slide. We'll go through these relatively quickly. Here's urban sprawl, right? Um, we don't have this dense sprawl around here in Western PA probably because of our topography, but if you go to parts of like Northern Virginia and Philadelphia out east or um, boy out into like the Las Vegas area, this is what you see, right? Formerly habitat that is now nothing more than um, densely urban sprawl with almost no biodiversity. In fact, a lot of even the trees and green that you see in there are non-native things like calorie or, or barlet pears that they put in that almost support no insects, right? We'll go to the next slide here. This is the other one that we are working really hard to change people's minds, and that is that are lawn deserts, right? Um, after World War II, um, lawns became sort of that suburban ideal, a perfectly manicured lawn, but lawns are biological deserts. They support almost very, well, they support some insects, but very few, right? And only a few birds like robins and our non-native starlings and sometimes grackles will use that, but that is a desert. And that is absolutely one of the biggest reasons with the suburbanization in the last 60, 70 years since the end of World War II, of our landscapes, probably the main reason why we're seeing um, insect declines and then bird declines as a result. We'll go to the next slide, All right? So I just wanna give you some facts, something to think about here. And, and for the record, I have about an acre here in my house. I do have lawn, there's no doubt, right? I mean, I, this is not to demonize people that, that you know, like lawns. I have a, my son is a big soccer player, so we leave grass for him to play, right? Um, but I want you to think about this though, right? American lawns occupy some 30 to 40 million acres of land across the uh, United States. And, you know, lawn mowers that we use for them account for some 5% of all of our air pollution, right? And clearly with all the smoke we're getting now, we're, you know, air pollution is something we're probably thinking about. But even when we don't have that smoke in these really warm days of summer, right? You get a lot of ozone or air action days. A lot of that's because of lawn mowers. Um, each year, more than 17 million gallons of fuel, mostly gasoline, are spilled during the refilling of our lawn and garden equipment, right? This is the other one a lot of people don't know. Lawns use 10 times the amount of pesticide and fertilizers per acres on their lawns as farmers do on all of our crops in the United States, right? And then these chemicals um, often run off and became a major, become a major source of water pollution, particularly in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus. You get a lot of algae blooms. A lot of ours ends up down in uh, the Gulf of Mexico where you have basically dead zones from all of the nitrogen that the algae uses and just eats up all the oxygen. And then 30 to 60% of our urban fresh water is used on lawns. So our lawns are not only biological deserts, we're spending just enormous amounts of energy in all various sources to actually keep these perfectly manicured lawns. Go to the next slide. So again, these are just, I'll go through this relatively quickly here. You see these you know, pesticides and these large um, agricultural croppings um, that you see in some spots. Now, thankfully here in Western PA, we have a lot more smaller um, farm markets and family farms. I worked at one in the North Hills, maybe some of you are familiar with. I worked at Kalen's Farm Market for seven years, um, right down the road from Sorgles. While they're not organic, at least Kalen's wasn't, um, they still at least produce a lot better um, types of, of produce that is not as pesticide heavy. We'll go to the next slide. And here's our invasive monocultures, right? This is garlic mustard. And one thing you'll notice when you see these monoculture of these invasives take over, you will look at their leaves and see either none or almost zero insect activity on them. Because they're non-native, our native insects did not co-evolve with them. They do not use them. 
Um, and as you can imagine, as these start monopolizing our landscapes, the knock-on effect will be to drastically reduce insect populations. And garlic mustard is a nasty one because it will produce chemicals in its roots, it's aleopathic, that will actually stop other native plants from growing, right? We'll go to the next slide. Here's a real bad one that's in Franklin Park and in, in McCandless and all around now in Allegheny County and even here in Butler. Um, this is stilt grass. And stilt grass can grow in very thick mats. It can grow two to sometimes if you get enough uh, uh, moisture and stuff, it can grow as high as three feet and completely outcompete everything. It has almost zero um, positive things for birds other than maybe a few seeds for one or two sparrow species, but even then it's not a whole lot. We'll go to the next slide. There we go. And so this is another one, knotweed, which grows really tall. It is overtaking a lot of our um, sort of repairing environments along our rivers and creeks and streams really decreasing very rapidly a lot of um, species that a lot of our uh, waterfowl and riparian species need to, to survive. This is a really nasty one. This one is really, really difficult to get rid of. Still grass responds pretty well to really light levels of herbicides. Not this one. This one takes a long, lot of effort, long time to actually get rid of. And I know because I was an intern at the Allegheny Land Trust, and that was my job basically all summer. And um, if I've gone back, it was 20 years ago, I think it's actually probably expanded since then. And they've probably expanded their invasive removal. So it's a tough one. Go to the next slide. So I have this on here, as I mentioned, right? I, and, and some of you, I'm not sure your ages, but I, I've just been teaching in our the local schools. I did a big program on pollination for a lot of school districts here in Western PA. And you know, these younger kids don't have the context like you and I do. I'm 46. Um, I do remember, and I was just talking with my parents about when, when I was younger, even when I first started driving in the early 90s, when you would drive in the warmer months, maybe some of you remember this, do you remember how often our windshields would be covered with insects that would be hitting? And I want you to think about now how rarely that happens. Um, I remember driving not just here, but down into North Carolina where we go on vacation and you'd be going through some, some swampy areas and it would just, your windshield would look like this. You don't see that anymore. That is a direct consequence from all of these invasives and landscape urban sprawl causing this mass insect decline. Um, it, it's going to cross board, right? Everybody focuses on pollinators, with, which you know is very important, right? But a ton of other species that birds depend upon or bats depend upon are just also part of that major decline, right? So. Um, that is that really screaming, that canary is teetering right now when it comes to insects. And that, that does keep me up at night. We'll go to the next slide. There are invasive insects like this one attacking our state tree, the Eastern hemlock. This is um, hemlock woolly adulged. They at this stage look like little snowballs. They're, like, they're in the aphid family and they will basically um, suck all of the juices until the, the tree will drop those needles. It, if the tree is already stressed or not in a great situation to begin with, it will kill the hemlock within two or three years. Um, if you have been down to the Great Smoky Mountains recently, 400, 500 year old hemlocks are all dead because of this particular invasive. Um, our colder winters historically had kept it at bay. This was introduced in the 50s down in Virginia. But now with climate change and our warming winters, it is spread all through Western Pennsylvania. It is up in Cook's Forest too, where they're actively um, managing that. So why this is such a big deal too, is if we lose our hemlocks, that is uh, not just our state tree, right? But a lot of our birds that are common now depend on that species as a keystone species. If we lose our hemlocks, which we are slated to, if things continue with this particular uh, invasive uh, uh, species of insect, we're going to lose a large number of our birds that are right are still common right now. Next slide. 
You may know this one. This one is uh, our spotted lanternfly that has recently, in the last couple of years, really showed up in force in Western Pennsylvania, particularly Pittsburgh. I was going to a pit game last year and they were just peppering us in, in uh, Heinz Field. So this one too is, um, we hope birds will adapt, but it is going to really change the component of a lot of our forest if it in fact kills, like we think a lot of our maples, right? Um, we'll go to the next slide. This is also, this is one that a lot of people, um, including people that work for me at Auto or work with us here at Audubon, outdoor cats, right? We, you know, I, I'm, I don't have cats because I'm allergic. I'm a dog person, but we have nothing against cats. Cats are great pets, right? Um, but they belong inside. Cats do, as you'll see some of the figures here, an extremely enormous damage to our bird populations. They are not native to North America. So a lot of our songbirds do not or have not developed the ability to um, you know, uh, adapt to their hunting techniques. And it's theorized that we lose about 1 billion individual birds across North America every year due to outdoor cat predation. It is a huge problem that is very, very acrimonious when you bring up this subject. There, there's a lot of challenges with this one, but I do want to introduce you to this fact that not only do they kill a large number of birds, it is much safer for cats to be indoors, right? We'll go to the next slide. The other one that we are actively working, in fact, here within the next year, this is gonna be a big part of what I'm gonna be doing now with uh, Audubon is window strikes. Window strikes are usually birds first encounter with glass is their last encounter with glass. Even birds that strike windows and you know people will put them in a box and release them. They've shown 70 to 80% of those ones that fly off end up succumbing to injuries from um, head trauma, usually brain bleed. Um, glass also kills an enormous amounts of birds. Um, though there are some relatively simple things you can do to avoid this, especially if you have a problem window. And um, companies like PPG and other glass companies are working on finding film that the glass looks completely normal to us, but birds can actually perceive it. Because for them and their, their um, vision range, glass just looks like a clear space to fly through. And there's nothing in their evolutionary history will say there's a solid object there. And they also kill an enormous amount of birds. Go to the next slide. Okay, so here's some figures to think about, right? It's estimated that outdoor cats kill between 1.3 and 1.4 billion birds each year in the United States alone. That's excluding Canada and Mexico. When I was in Costa Rica with Audubon this past winter, we, we do bird tours. I actually saw some evidence of feral cats and they are really, really big in protecting their birds in Costa Rica, but they also have feral cats that are not native, right? Where cats are, are not, they're from originally in, in Asia and Africa, um, killing birds there. So this is when you think that we have maybe just a hair under 7 billion birds in North America, losing 1.3 to 1.4 billion every year is unsustainable. And that's a big factor as well. We think roughly about 600 million are estimated to be killed by window collisions, maybe 200 million killed by automobiles and um, but building communication tower strikes. So all of these things, and, and including the loss of habitat, invasives, all of these things are really, really lining up to put birds in a really tough place, um, and including here in Western Pennsylvania. Go to the next slide. This is the one, I, I mean, of all things that, that keep me up at night, this one also is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, and this is climate change, right? In, in climate change, you're, you're already, and we have been seeing, not just here in Western PA, but um, with more fires as, as the Arctic warms, right? We're seeing all the smoke, um, not because, again, those, those fires in Canada were, were due to um, lightning strikes, but um, those forests up there are drying out rapider than they've ever dried out. Um, so there's more 
ability for these wildfires to happen. So a lot of these, this has been, Audubon's been studying this particular issue for a long time now. And their newest update in 2019 shows that out of a roughly 800 species, 389 species in North America are potentially going to be negatively impacted by climate change. That does not mean all 389 are going to go extinct. Um, it means a lot of them are going to be pushed in rapid decline. And then you've got these other factors that they've got to contend with. However, they've done some updates internally that I could see. And we're looking at about 140, roughly 30, 40 species that climate change alone could potentially make them what we call climate endangered. Now, to give you an example, since Europeans and then um, came to North America and then Asians, Africans and everybody from across the globe, we've only lost nine species of birds here in eastern North America that have gone extinct, right? All of them very important. Think about that. By the end of this century, climate change, its potential, we could have 130, 140 extinct just from climate change alone. And then these other ones, right, will be in steep decline and they've got to account for all these things. So this one really keeps me up at night and concerned. Uh, we'll go to the next slide here. And it's because of things like this, right? Atmospheric carbon that us human beings are putting in the air. Um, honestly, you know, I'm not sure what any of you, if, if you do think about climate change or, you know, it's something that you think about, really within the scientific world, it's not controversial. I mean, the evidence is, is very strongly clear. I know they say in science, right, correlation is not causation, but boy, there's uh, the, the correlation is very, very close to when you see, we're at 423 parts per million in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, where in the start of the industrial revolution, we were about a hundred and, oh, I don't know. Um, I think we were about 180, 200, something like that. So that might not seem like a whole lot, uh, but you can see this is going back over 600,000 years. You can see the atmospheric carbon was really tied to things like um, ice ages, right? Uh, but we are really, really conducting an experiment in our atmosphere that is showing right now and has been um, that we're doing some serious damage to our ecosystems as the climate across the globe warms. We'll go to the next slide. And you can see things like this, right? So if you garden, right? I always see the two easiest groups of people to talk about climate change are people that um, garden and people that are birders, right? Um, it's because like, and I, I do both. You're seeing, I in 1990, I was in seventh grade at Ingemar Middle School, not too far away from you there. Look how much different our hardiest zones have shifted in that period of time. Right. Um, we're seeing massive ma and this is they're going to update it again here in, in 2025. Our springs are becoming really much warmer, very erratic. We go from like we did this April 80s down back down to the 30s and then up to the 80s again. Um, that really messes with a lot of insect and plant populations that evolved in a more um, consistent type of, of climate. And I will tell you, we see those um, issues with a lot of these birds like black hole warblers that are arriving in the insects that for thousands, if not millions of years that they depend on with the oaks. Um, you know, when there's these insects that are coming up from the tropics, they're already past their, their cycle and they're already, you know, basically become adult insects at that point where these birds don't eat that. So that is a big part of their decline because we're screwing up these natural cycles that a lot of these birds have co-evolved with. Go to the next slide here. And we see this right with our climate. And you can see two different uh, scenarios there um, where we are warming, right? And the higher emission scenario is the one we're on right now. If we continue on this path that we're on, that's where we'll be by the end of the century. Our climate here will be more typical to what you would find in northern Alabama. Um, we've already seen a shift from 1961 to 1990 southward. It's just going to continue. We hope the lower emission scenario will be the one that we can focus on. But right now, I'll be just totally honest with you, we're not headed down that path. Next slide. So um, I think, again, to not to belabor the um, report, but if you want to read this, I, I think this is really, really good science that they did on this. 
um, they looked at an enormous amount of different, um, and they only focused on 604 North American bird species out of the um, complete total, because some of them are, are a little bit harder to study here. A lot of things, like I lead the Christmas bird count, I do breeding bird surveys. Um, if you ever want to take part in the Christmas bird count around Christmas time into the beginning of the new year, your counting helps scientists take a look at these trends over time, right? And so they've looked at a huge amount of bird records over time and basically trying to create a field guide and map to where these birds are going to move potentially if the climate warms in these various scenarios. Go to the next slide. And so, right, so out of those 604 species modeled, they found 389 vulnerable um, potentially to extinction, not all because of climate, right? So that means that as soon as 2080, more than half of their current range would become inhospitable and they won't gain new habitat. Everybody thinks, well, as the climate warms, right, their range will just expand north. It's actually not the case. Some of it might actually, and they're showing more and more signs of this, might just actually completely disappear. 99% of birds um, could have to cope with more frequent extreme weather events, right? Like intense spring heat, heavy rainfall, more fires, um, things like that. And if you get closer to areas in the, the ocean, right? Sea level rise and urbanization could consume much needed habitat. Um, so most birds will likely experience multiple compounding threats, including already those invasives and everything else. And one thing to think about, right? A lot of our birds that come here to breed, like our Orioles, and I start with that Scarlet Tanager and Wood Thrush, they're, they're coming from the tropics and having to land in multiple different types of habitats before they get here. So you might go, well, yeah, I don't live next to the ocean. I don't have a house down there. Why should I care, right? Well, again, a lot of those birds have to go through those places and refuel. And as we're losing those through development and other reasons, that's also a huge part in why these birds are threatened with climate change. Go to the next slide. Okay. Um, and again, I've, I've, already, I've already talked about some of these things here. I just put this in as sort of the summary here. Um, but, you know, this is what scares me. Significant population declines occurred among hundreds of bird species. That's where we see these big losses. So ones that are still even considered common, like white-throated sparrows, right? Um, or, or rusty blackbirds, or even common nighthawks that have, you know, in the 80s and 90s were very common. They have rapidly declined, very rapidly declined. Go to the next slide. We'll go through this very quickly here. Um, we'll go to the next slide. These are our chimney swifts. You can go to the next one, Katie. Um, Great urban bird. We were watching these with some kids the last couple of days. Um, we're doing a kids birding camp next week, so we get to watch them. And at ASWP, if you've ever seen our chimney swift towers, um, it's for these guys. Go to the next slide. And they're interesting in the fact that they cannot perch. So they have to hang on a vertical surface. That's why they need, they used to breed in interior of large hollow trees, but we lost them, right? When they were cut down for farmland but really adapted well to brick masonry and chimneys. Uh, but those have been, you know, being capped or new steel lined flues doesn't allow them to do that. And that is that along with lack of insects has caused these birds to really, really rapidly decline. Go to the next slide here. So these are things that you may have seen these before. If you really are hardcore about chimney swifts, you can easily build these in, in your yard. You don't need all the fancy graphics and everything else to make it look really, really um, fancy there, but that's what it looks like. That's a chimney swift tower where they will breed within there. And uh, we're seeing already in the county parks, and this is along the riverfront trail, that these are having a big impact in keeping our population stable here in Western PA. Go to the next slide. Um, just really quick here, because I, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. This bird, again, uh, we're, we're seeing a very, very rapid decline across range. We're still holding on pretty well here in Western PA, but declining 63% since 1966, mostly in areas that have seen really, really heavy urbanization like Northern Virginia and parts of Eastern Pennsylvania. That's probably due to loss of insects. And, and that's in breeding sites, certainly you can put all the breeding sites you want, but if there's no insects, 
because they're aerial insectivores, then you've got an issue. Go to the next slide. Ah, so our, our state bird, the wonderful ruffed grouse, right? And if you've never seen a ruffed grouse or heard a ruffed grouse drumming or had the pleasure of walking up six inches from one and one flushing and giving you a near heart attack in the middle of the woods, um, they're really cool birds. Um, again, our state bird, Pennsylvania, called ruffed grouse because you can see that it looks like ruffles around those males there. Males are able to create a, a mini sonic boom that you can hear throughout the forest um, when they would flap their wings to attract the female's attention and do these displays. I have not heard, I remember growing up again in Franklin Park and hearing them every spring, at least into when I graduated high school in 95. I have not found a rough grouse in Allegheny County in probably 25 years. Um, they were already declining because of, of um, you know, loss of habitat. But even here in Butler and up in the Algae National Forest, it's been a long time since I've heard one. Go to the next slide. And they come in two different colors there, right? So you see another display there. That's the Rufus or the red. They're red and gray. Go to the next slide. And there's one doing its dance. They're just really neat birds. If you've never watched, you should go online, watch them on YouTube. They're really cool how they do all these different struts and dances and everything. The things us guys do to attract the attention of you ladies. So. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. Here's the sonic boom here, right? So this is the male. Once he sits on top of a log, he makes that wing flap. That, again, it does. It creates a mini sonic boom. Go to the next slide. All right. So um, we see that they were slowly, steadily declining throughout um, Pennsylvania, right? In Northeast and Midwest, mostly because of what we call and this would be an easy issue to solve. It was because a lot of the, it was uneven forest growth, right? So our forests were all cut, they grew up and now they're all the same age. They need younger forests, brusher forests. Well, they started to manage for them and they were doing, they were doing quite well um, until the year 2000, which we'll talk about here in a second. However, 2019, that's the most updated statistics I have because COVID kind of interrupted this. That year, what we call the recruitment, so proportion of immature birds, older ones, it was the lowest in 37 years in 2019, and it has little to do with hunting. Um, it's actually the, the following. We'll go to the next slide. Versus loss of habitat, losing a lot of these areas in Franklin Park and McCandless and other places nearby to um, housing developments, right? Um, forest fragmentation from development, all of those things were really, really big. But I mentioned, right, I mean, PA, we're back to being about 60% wooded. A lot of our forest is, uh, is even aged forest, so it needs young forest. So they started to cut parts of forest and let it regrow. Again, as the forest would have naturally been done if storms come through, knock them down. Um, but the problem was, is the grouse were still rapidly declining. So that, that was part of it, but not the major thing. We'll go to the next slide here. It's really West Nile. And West Nile, you may have heard of it, is an invasive virus that um, was first found in North America in 1999. Um, first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2021. It's, it's spread by a mosquito that is um, native to Egypt. It came over in ballast water in big ships. Um, and originally, we thought it was going to cause severe problems with the corvids, so our crows and blue jays and ravens. And it did at first, but they rapidly developed, um, evolved some kind of resistance to it. However, we have now found that the rough grouse is highly susceptible to West Nile. And mortality rates when they get it is as high as almost 95 to 99 percent. And even in areas where there's great habitat uh, in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, it is there's almost no rough grass. Um, and it is clearly now the major, major issue, probably number one. And as we're getting warmer, and I know it hasn't rained here in a while, but wetter years, this particular mosquito reproduces very rapidly. So that is really a major, major problem with, with these guys. And out of all of this, because I'm going to bring it back, there are some positive things, I promise you here. This one, though, um, unless something rapidly changes, we may truly, and I'm not joking, have to think of a, a, a new state bird. We'll go to the next slide. 
This is showing here uh, Audubon by 2080 with climate change in West Nile. Uh, that bird will be completely gone now, not just Pennsylvania um, and the Appalachians, but all of the Northeast. So it is a bird that will continue to thrive, hopefully in other areas, but we will no longer have it here, uh, which will be a major, major shame. So next slide, please. Okay, so all of that bad news, right? I've, I've and again, I, I have to paint the picture as reality presents it, right? But there is hope. And I truly believe that. I'm not just throwing that out there to um, not bum you out. There really is hope. Um, these are birds that we don't really get here in Western PA. These are black um, skimmers, but I think it is good to think that there's a lot of species that um, you're familiar with that not long ago were on the verge of extinction here. So we'll go to the next slide. So there are relatively easy things that you can do that people here in Western Pennsylvania and Allegheny County and across are already doing that are shown to have enormous positive impacts for our local bird species, right? So the first one, the easiest thing you can do is get rid of at least part of your lawn and plant native plant species, right? That does not mean you have to get rid of every last piece, right, of, of grass. Um, I know Americans love their lawn. That's not what we're saying at all. But if you have nothing but lawn that's mowed three times a week, that is really, again, all the pollution and everything else is really not helping birds. And our native plant species produce the amount of insects that these birds need, right? We just have what people call no mow may. Not everybody goes to that level. Um, I don't even at some points not do that, mainly because my grass would be impossible to cut if I didn't, but I leave a large section of my yard um, wild with either gardens, native plants, trees, everything that I do to try to help promote um, insects for these birds. If you're really interested in that and you want some help, we have um, at Audubon Society of Western PA our what we call our Certified Backyard Habitat Program. We will send someone out from ASWP that will take a look, talk with you about your goals and give you some recommendations. You can sign up at our website. It's becoming incredibly popular. We've created something like five or six new reserves across Allegheny County when you aggregate all of that um, properties that have done this. So those things really, really do help. Stop spraying pesticides and herbicides, right? Dandelions are actually not bad. <laughs> Believe it or not, they're really good for birds and insects, right? Keep your cats indoors. If you love Fluffy and you know you want Fluffy to be safe and you want to help birds, keep them inside. Um, you can help prevent window strikes by adding reflective uh, film on windows. The hawk silhouettes do not work. Uh, they've showed that time and time again. But there's, um, if you're interested, you can uh, our our stores at Beechwood and Suck Up Nature Park and, and down at Buffalo Creek. Beachwood's probably closer to everybody. Um, we have this type of reflective film that, that really works and is shown to work very well. And then um, it should not say help remove native, it should say help remove invasive species. Obviously, I don't know what I was thinking there, had native plants on the mind. It should say help remove invasive and plant native plant species. So we'll go to the next slide here. All right, and, and you know, I'm going again through this relatively quickly because I want to be mindful of, of, of everybody's time and open up the questions here. With all of this, again, I know this is there's a lot that is very depressing and challenging with the environment, but honestly, birds really are depressing at times. But I want you to think that it was not that long ago where our national bird, the bald eagle, when um, JFK was president in the early 60s, there was only 400 pairs left in the lower 48 of bald eagles. Pennsylvania had none for a period of time. And when I was born in 1976, in our country's bicentennial, we had a grand total of two bald eagles in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Today, we have several thousand. We stopped counting them because there's so many of them, there's no point. Now, my family is originally from the south side of Pittsburgh. And if you're familiar with our bald eagle camera, it's mind boggling to me when you understand how bad things were in the south side where my family was in the 1920s and uh, that we have a really successful pair of bald eagles breeding in the south side of Pittsburgh. 
and they are now everywhere. And they're not the only species, right? Osprey were almost non-existent. They were endangered. Peregrine falcons, right, which are at, at the Cathedral of Learning and the, the Gulf Tower now everywhere here. Brown pelicans. Even uh, when the Audubon chapters were being formed uh, for a lot of our shorebirds, like the great egret and great blue herons that were, be hunting, that were being hunted for the millinery trade, a lot of those birds were on the verge of extinction and are incredibly common across North America now and um, even here in Western PA, right? Um, so my point is, is, as dire as it looks, we still have time to help stop the extinction or the least increasing decline of a lot of these bird species with simple things that we can do at home. Go to the next slide. So these are my last two slides here, and then I'll open up the questions here. I want you to think, again, we are, I mean, nature and even planet Earth, we're all interconnected somehow. And that's why I think this analogy here with the spider web, because, and I see this as I travel and I go to the tropics, right, in Costa Rica in January, where I saw there was just our Baltimore Orioles were everywhere down there, or our, even our osprey go down to Costa Rica and Central and South America, right? Our ruby-throated hummingbirds, that's where they overwinter. We are all interconnected like a spider web, right? And we are part of nature, right? We like to think that we're above nature, but um, we are part of nature and things that affect nature affect us. I mean, this smoke is a prime example of that, right? So lastly here, we'll go to the last slide. I'll leave you with this quote from someone that is a Pittsburgh native, right? From Springdale and someone that I think is really influential to me. And arguably when you study her, Without Rachel Carson, bald eagles would be extinct. It's rare in history, you can go back and look at one person making a major change. And I truly believe that. And I think this is a great quote from her. I'm gonna update the language since she wrote this in the 60s, right? This is from her really famous book, the Silent Spring, right? So she says, um, our human's attitude toward nature is today critically important simply because we have now acquired a faithful power to alter and destroy nature. But humankind is a part of nature and our war against nature is inevitably a war against ourselves. And we are challenged as humankind has never been challenged before to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. And to summarize there, that is a good example of that because these birds are showing us that we are causing these rapid declines and we are part of nature. And this is a war that we are waging against ourselves. And sometimes it just makes me shake my head with simple things like lawns and stuff like that, that, you know, we're doing this. So with that said, thank you for being patient with the technical difficulties um, with us. And if you have any questions now, you can either unmute and ask, or you can ask Katie, how, Katie, however you want to do this. I'm, I'm more than open to answer any questions you may have. All right. Well, we'll start with um, one question. I'll start with the one that was um, brought up that I also wondered when he said it. Uh, what caused the extinction of the passenger pigeon? That is a great question. That is actually a really interesting, and it's not as cut and dry as things usually are. That is That bird is what's known or was known, because it's extinct, as uh, an outbreak species, right? So for example, think of, think of these grasshoppers, it's in the Bible, right, in, in, in uh, Africa and Asia called a locust. And we have them in North America, but in our grasslands, right? Locusts are a prime example of what you call an outbreak species. So it's always there in a certain population, but when certain conditions are right, it rapidly mass produces itself into super large numbers, right? And that's what passenger pigeons did. When they, when Europeans first, right? I don't know, not being Eurocentric, just they're the first ones that wrote this down. When they first encountered passenger pigeons, we are seeing, particularly from the English, Europeans had already been in North America for about 150 years. And so we think a lot of the diseases that Europeans spread to Native Americans, wiped out Native Americans, and allowed regrowth of, of some forests, right? Pasture pigeons then as an outbreak species probably rapidly increased, but they did some DNA studies of some of those um, 
specimens that they have show that throughout millions of years, they've been, their populations would grow and fall. However, they cannot reproduce if their numbers drop below a certain number. So I forget how many millions that is. What had happened is people have been hunting passenger pigeons, Native Americans, and then European settlers for a long time until the Civil War hits and you see two things happen. One, trains create the ability of people and telegraphs to find where these birds who were big colony nesters, they would nest in colonies 800 miles, sometimes wide. Uh, that's not an exaggeration. So one colony could be over a billion birds in 800 miles of forest. They, here's the downside though, if they were disturbed, they wouldn't breed that year and, and they would only lay one egg. Well, people started hunting them nonstop in both their breeding grounds and wintering grounds from about the 1860s to about the 1880s, every year nonstop. And then that caused a rapid decrease in them very, very rapidly because they weren't reproducing year after year. What happened then in the 1870s and 80s was that a lot of the large intact forests that they needed for what's called mast, right? So acorns, beech nuts, American chestnuts that they ate were rapidly cut down with all the logging that swept through Pennsylvania and the Northeast and other parts of Appalachia. In fact, one of my relatives from Sweden came over and that's what they did. They were lumbermen, right? So maybe this is my environmental penance for that. Once those birds then not only were being persecuted when they, and they couldn't reproduce, now they didn't have the food, they declined so fast that literally they went from billions to functionally extinct in the wild in about 25 years. They only hung on in like really small numbers, but even then they did not have the social facilitation to find that food. It's actually more complex than people think, but it's like anything, once they start to decline, it's like you, you, there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle. And um, today we probably could have preserved them, but back then it just didn't have a way to do that. But it's a both sad and fascinating story for sure. Any other questions? We had another one in the chat that was interesting as well. Okay. Um, also, the only, not like they're uninteresting ones. The no, time. sure, yeah. Um, but it's like, can birds be ventriloquists? I was walking in the area that had a couple of plovers, and their call seemed like it was coming from all directions, above, on the ground, and on all sides. Mm, they can throw their voice a little bit, but I wouldn't call it that. What you're probably what that person is experiencing there is is probably a killed deer, which is a type of plover. Um, and when you approach their either eggs or young, they will do two things. One pair will call on the ground and pretend it has a broken wing, but the other will fly above making those calls. And it's hard to see them and you're trying to distract the predator. I've watched them do this with cats actually and, and sometimes successful, about half the time they're successful. So it might seem like that. The other thing too, when you think of birds, when they're singing, they're not usually you know, well, they're not usually, they're always not doing it for us. They're doing it for a different reason. And they're often, and I was just teaching this the other day when I had my adult birding camp, that they will be turning their heads in different directions. So it'll sound like they're throwing their voice in different areas, but really they're just turning their head and broadcasting that song. And those songs are always males. Females, with just a few exceptions, do not sing. It's always males that do that. All right, thank you for those. If we have any other questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself to ask. I'll give a couple of minutes in case anyone is typing or would like to unmute and ask. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hopefully, like I said, this smoke goes by. It makes me wonder up there in Quebec where this is all happening. This has to be disrupting a lot of birds that are in probably in the middle of their breeding season now but again fires aren't new i mean they they've had fires at some points it's just the scale and, and the frequency of this is starting to happen a little bit more um often more frequent right compared in the past so um and of course we have to enjoy it down here and i don't know about you but boy it's it's been really wearing on me here the last couple of days
All right. Well, it seems like we must have you. You answered everything so thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. But if, if after you... the fact, if anyone thinks of any questions, you can always feel free to uh, send me an email. I can pass you on to Chris or reach out to the Audubon Society if you have any concerns or anything that Chris mentioned you would like to do to help, um, you know, help out with your yard or in your area. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much, Chris. And yeah, thank you to you as well for your patience with all of the, <laughs> the technical difficulties we had going on tonight. It's always, it's always uh, something I, I experience the same things. So thank you everybody for your patience and thank you, Katie, for having me. And I hope to speak again sometime. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, we hope to uh, have Chris again soon. Um, I know some of you had attended the one we had previously on the winter birds and I know that was very popular. So I always love, love having you here with us, Chris. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we'll enjoy your evening and we'll see you all soon. Good night, everyone. All right, take care.